The first car that I ever called my own was a 1991 sky blue Chevy Cavalier. Uh, I drove this car for two years, and it only caused me trouble. I was telling my staff the other day that a chunk of the flywheel on the engine had broken off. And if you don't know what a flywheel is, it's essentially this really big gear that once you start your engine, it like keeps the engine going. And mine was missing a bunch of the geared teeth. Not really sure how it happened, but that's just the way it was. And so in order to start the car, I'd have to pop the hood and reach in and grab the belt and I'd have to pull the belt a bunch of times so that the, the broken parts did not line up and I could actually get the car started. Uh, this car broke down on me multiple times. I, I was very used to just parking it on the side of the highway and just leaving it for days at a time. Uh, one time it was because a rat had chewed through some of the wire and it fried my alternator. And even though this car needed a decent amount of work, what I felt like it needed more than anything else was a CD player and a better sound system. I was 16, okay? <laughs> Terrible priorities in my life. But what I wanted more than anything was have just a really great sound system, and really what I wanted was some subs. And so I bought, <laughs> listen, 16-year-old Michael, okay? Uh, so I bought a brand new Pioneer uh, in-dash CD player. You know the ones I'm talking about. They're the ones that had the faceplate that you could like eject from it so you could hide it. <laughs> like people are going to steal your stereo. Uh, it's the ones that the best feature was that you could change the colors on it, you know, depending on your mood. It's blue or really just red. Those are the two options. So along with that, I bought some brand new speakers and I built a speaker box to throw some subs in my trunk. And uh, just to date myself a little bit, the CDs that are burned in my memory from the era of my life were Linkin Park. Yes. Yep, <laughs> still though. Uh, Nelly. Yes. Switchfoot, you're gonna see all of it here. Uh, and this like super emo punk band called Hawthorne Heights, uh, which if you listen to punk, you know who they are. They just cried for like every song. Um, and the thing was, I didn't have the money to install this, the stereo professionally, so I decided that I would do it myself. And I called up a friend of mine, his dad was a mechanic, and we got to work because we figured, like, how hard could this actually be? Now, mind you, this was pre-YouTube days, right? You couldn't go on YouTube and find a video where someone walks you through step by step. There was a single installation manual, it looked like it came from Ikea, just a bunch of pictures. And the idea was that these stereos would fit into every make and model of car, which isn't true, right? It's just not possible. And so it took us all day, but we got the stereo installed. And I remember jumping into the front seat of my car and turning it on and watching that cover plate light up, right? There was power. And so I grabbed my Nellyville CD and I popped it in because uh, I just wanted to hear the sound of the bass from Air Force Ones. But instead of hearing that, all I got was a high-pitched hum, and so I removed the CD, I put it back in, same sound. I powered down the stereo, I turned it back on, same sound. Right, we tried everything we could, but all it was was just this really high-pitched hum. The next day, I woke up, I was getting ready for school, it was raining outside, and I got in my car to drive to school, and I turned on my headlights, I turned on my windshield wipers, and there was a really loud pop. And then, give me two pairs, I need two pairs, because I... Thank you for the few of you. You all know this song. Don't do this to me, okay? Goodness gracious, you guys act like you didn't listen to this. Man, so all of a sudden, it's working, right? And I have no idea how, but it's working. And so after school that day, I grabbed my friend, I show him that it worked, that we figured it out on our own. But when I started the car up, it was just the high-pitched hum again. Right, and I felt crazy, and so I start talking him through everything I did that morning. I sit in my car, and I turn on my headlights, pop, Give me two bears, I need two bears. And we realized what had happened was that we had mistakenly wired the stereo to the power of my headlights. <laughs> we had crossed up the wires. And so in order for my stereo to work, I had to turn the headlights on for the next two years of my life. Today, we are in the second week of our series called Winning the War in Your Mind that is inspired by a book with the same name, by Pastor Craig Rochelle. And the theme verse for this series comes from Romans 12. Romans 12, it says this in verse two. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what Paul is saying is don't think like the world thinks, don't act like the world acts, don't behave like the world behaves. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. 
be renewed, be changed by the renewing of our minds. And last week we jumped into this series and we talked about how our mind is a battlefield and that many of us, including myself, are constantly at war with our thoughts. And we looked at this really powerful scripture from 2 Corinthians 10 where Paul tells us that we, while we live in the world, we don't wage war the way the world does because we have been given this gift, right, these weapons from God that have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we said that these strongholds are a wrong pattern of thinking. Right? It's this lie that we believe. It's a place where the wires in our brains have been mixed up. Right? They, they've been crossed. And so we need to fight back against these strongholds. We need to take our thoughts captive, and we do that by replacing those lies with the truth of God. Because our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Right, what comes into our minds tends to come out in our lives, and that's because we have these neural pathways in our brains. Right? Every time we think a thought, we're creating a new pattern of thinking, and our experiences and our thoughts are wiring or programming our brains. Think about it like this. Uh, when it comes to little kids, if a baby smiles and then the mom smiles back, the baby's brain creates a neural pathway saying, smiling is good. If a toddler touches a hot stove and they feel pain, the toddler's brain creates a pathway that says, don't touch hot stoves. If a toddler wants ice cream, but it's right before dinner, and the dad says no, and the toddler starts to lose their mind, and the dad caves and gives their child the ice cream because it's the only way the kid will stop crying. That's too real, isn't it? Right? That child's brain says, crying gets me ice cream. Some of you first-time parents haven't figured this out yet, have you? Right? When your kid cries and you give them what they want, you are creating a pathway in their brain that says, crying equals getting what I want. And so when we think a thought, our brain is creating these new neural pathways. And the more we think a thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. Right? The more dominant that thought becomes, it's like a mental trail in our brain. And this is really good news when we're thinking about truth, but this is incredibly bad news when so many of us are believing a lie. What ends up happening is we have these wires that are crossed. These pathways that lead to pain, pathways that lead to insecurity, pathways that lead to fear and distrust and anxiety and anger and so much more. And so today we're going to continue to look at the life of Paul in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, and we're going to watch him as he battles this war in his mind. Because as you read through all the things that he wrote in the New Testament, what we see is we see him processing we see him learning, we see him fighting, we see him growing, and ultimately we can learn from him through his own experiences. And so here's some context for what we're about to read. We're gonna be in the book of Philippians. Um, this is actually just a few verses before the final verse I shared last week. And Paul is writing all this from a Roman prison. He is locked up, he is on house arrest. Um, he is awaiting possible execution because he was talking about Jesus. Right, and so he is in the worst case scenario, but this is what he says in Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Right, he has one more piece of advice for this church, this group of people who are following Jesus. And let me tell you what he doesn't say. Right, he doesn't say, there's one final thing. Look where I am. God, let me down. And the thing is, he probably could have thought that. He, he didn't say, one final thing. I can't go on with my life. He didn't say, things can't get any worse than this. This is what he said. He said, now, brother, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. His one final thing is to fix your thoughts on what is true. Fix your thoughts on what is honorable. Fix your thoughts on the things that are right and pure and lovely and admirable. He doesn't say, fix your thoughts on the worst case scenario, on the things that you hate, on what you're afraid of, on everything that could go wrong, on what he said to you, on what she did to you. He said, fix your thoughts on what is good. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And I love the use of the word fix here because it has this double meaning. He says to fix your thoughts. What he's saying is to set them on the future. You look to the horizon about what is true and right and admirable and good, and don't take your thoughts off of those things. Really, you set your thoughts on the goodness of God and never look away. Keep living, keep moving, keep, keep pursuing those things. But I also love that we can read this in the idea that we need to fix what is broken. Because what is true is that the way we think is broken. 
The wires are switched. The lies feel like truth. We dwell on things that aren't excellent and aren't worthy of praise. We imagine the worst case scenario, the hurts, the failures, all of it. And so we need to fix our thoughts. One thing I didn't really think about until I was writing the sermon this week was why I never tried to fix my car. I drove it for two years that way, and and this feels weird. Like, we found out, we knew the wires were in the wrong place. We ultimately found out where we could have wired them correctly, but we never made the change. And it's because I just got comfortable with the wrong setup. In fact, we kind of made a joke out of it, like it was a part of the character of my car, and it was a part of my character. And when I eventually moved on from that car, what I did was I passed it on down to my sister, and I made it her problem to deal with. The problem is, though, that we do the same things with the lies we believe. We know they are lies. We know they are hurting us. We know they come from the words or actions of people who didn't deserve the right to impact our lives. We know that these came from hurt people who allowed the lies that they believe to come out sideways into our lives. We know that we need to heal and move on. Oftentimes, we need to forgive or accept forgiveness, that we need to replace the lie with truth. So why don't we do that? Why, don't we allow, why do we allow these lies to become part of our personality? And I'm going to press on parents for a second. Why do we let these become a part of who we are and then pass them down to our kids instead of doing the hard work to fix it? Right? Is it because it's tricky? It's a hard thing to do because it's easier just to believe the lies because we don't know where to start because it feels impossible. This week... I was reading some resources that one of the therapists at Collective sent me for this series. And one of the data points that I came across was that for every negative experience or like negative word that is said to us or about us, we need five positive experiences or positive words to balance it out, right? It's five to one. And if you've heard this before, you might've heard it's seven to one. Either way, the point is this. Those lies that we tell ourselves, those lies that we are holding on to, those lies we cannot shake, really those lies that we have grown comfortable with, those lies that tell us that we are worthless and unlovable and ugly and dumb and a failure or not good enough, not capable of, or just in general, not enough. If we want to remove those lies from our lives, we need five truths, five positive experiences to balance them out. So let me just say it like this. I am 37 years old. And if you are anything like me, the negative words are the ones that you dwell on and have been dwelling on for years. Really, I've fixed my thoughts on those negative words. And if I dig deep into my core memories, which I have done through therapy, through uh, the retreat I talked about last week, Crucible, through books, um, through my marriage, through my closest relationships, if I dig into my core memories, I can go back to when I was 10 years old as my earliest memory of feeling like I was not good enough. It's this very vivid memory I have in my brain. And I know there's other memories that come before 10, but this is that one when I think about, uh, I feel it. I still feel this experience in my heart and in my mind and in my soul. And I was 10 years old. This is the memory uh, that I can't shake. And so let's just say that I heard that phrase, you're not good enough, in my head one time every day since that moment. That's 27 years. It's 9,855 times. But as many of you know, that's not really how it works because it wasn't just a single moment when I was 10. It was when my parents got divorced and my dad walked out and started another family. It was when I was a freshman in high school and I, told, I was told I wasn't good enough to be on the baseball team. It's when I got the rejection letter from the first college that I applied to. It's when the girl I was dating in high school told me, maybe if you cared as much about school as you did about sports, you would have gotten into college. It was when I came home from my freshman year of college after deciding to go into ministry, and I went up to my pastor to tell him how excited I was to feel called to plant a church, and his response was, I wouldn't go to Milligan if you want to be a good pastor. It's getting fired from a job, being told I'm too introverted to be a good lead pastor. It's the boss who said I wouldn't be able to plant a church without him. And the thing is, just like your life, I can keep going. Moment after moment after moment of being told or feeling like I am not good enough. And my point is this. Most of the time, the lies we believe do not come from one experience. It is not one sentence. It is not one word. It's the same lie playing out over and over and over and over and over again. 
And so for many of us, what we're talking about is tens or hundreds of thousands of times we have believed a lie. Right? We have heard that lie. We've responded out of that lie, and it's become so much of who we are, it feels like truth. And if psychologists are right that it takes five positives for every one negative, I need to hear that I am enough 50,000 times to balance it out. And so what that means is that this doesn't get fixed one Sunday at church. This doesn't get fixed because you read your Bible one time. It does not get fixed after one therapy session. Right? Winning the war in your mind takes time. There is no quick fix for this. And the thing is, I really wish there was. I wish I could snap my fingers. I wish I could preach a four-week sermon series and we'd replace all the lies that we believe with God's truth. But fixing our thoughts, renewing our minds, defeating these strongholds takes time and effort and failure and getting back up again. But more than anything, as we continue to go through this series the next few weeks, more than anything, what this needs is Jesus. Because here's the truth. You will never be able to break free from the lies that you believe if your truth is rooted in anything other than him, right? Without Jesus, what we're talking about today and in this series is just self-help, right? That, that's all this is. But with Jesus, right, with his truth, not our truth, not the world's truth, with his truth, this is life-changing, right? It is chain-breaking truth. And so let me just say this to those of you who are searching for freedom in things other than Jesus, right? It is time to stop searching, it's time to stop looking for truth in other things. It's to let him be your leader. It's to let him be your forgiver. It's to let yourself put to death who you used to be to receive the new life that God has for you. He promises a fresh start. He promises forgiveness. And the reason that we believe all this is true is because Jesus made these promises and then he went to the cross to die for our sins and he backed it up by resurrecting from the dead. And so for some of you, to be honest, many of you for that matter, you are trying to fight a battle that you were not meant to fight alone. So going back to what Paul says, fix your thoughts on Jesus and don't look back. Right? We need to uncross the wires and we need to focus on what is true. And I don't know about you, um, but my mind drifts very quickly. And typically it's when I'm sitting in silence, it just goes the complete opposite direction of what I want to happen. It, it drifts to my own insecurities, my own fears, uh, really the lies that the devil has been telling me for years about myself. Right? I'll just be sitting in my office and I hear that voice, you're never going to be good enough. You are incapable, you are going to fail. How could God use you? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an exercise that I believe uh, really can be a game changer in focusing on those things that are true, those things from God. And, and I'm gonna show you uh, what I do and have done uh, through the advice of really smart people and how I've grown in my own thoughts um, and how I repeat some truth over and over and over again in order to try to create a new neural pathway in my mind. Um, so let's go back to last week where we had a little bit of homework. Last week, I encouraged you to think about the biggest stronghold that is holding you back. Right? What is the lie that is holding you back? Like, like you grew up in a household and you struggled financially and now you think you're not good with money. And so you believe that you don't control your money, but your money controls you. Or you might have the wires crossed, and you might think, I've tried for years, but I can't overcome this addiction. I'm never going to be able to break free. Or you believe that you've tried to get close to God, or maybe you're trying to get close to God again, but you're not sure he wants you to be close to him. Or you've worked so hard to get ahead, but you feel like you're never going to have a meaningful job. Or maybe you feel like you're never going to get married. Or maybe you're married, and you feel like you're not going to have a healthy marriage. What is the dominant stronghold where your mental wires are crossed, where the devil has tricked you into creating a neural pathway where you believe something that is not true about you? Right? That was the first part of the assignment from last week. The second part was then to name the scriptural truth that demolishes the lie that's holding you hostage. Right? What is the spiritual truth that demolish, demolishes that stronghold? And this is important, right? It's a scriptural truth, a biblical truth truth, not just truth or what the world believes is true, but a truth that comes from God. Now, did you all do that last week? Yeah, of course you did. You're collective. I believe in you. Now, here's what we're going to do today, though. Um, we're going to take this just a, a small step forward, not a huge leap, a small step. I want you to write down the truth that demolishes the lie, right? If you figured that out, write it down. Don't just think about it. 
Right? Don't just keep it up in your head. I want you to write it down at some point today, this week, in the next few days. Right? You can put it on a sticky note on your bathroom mirror. You can put it on an index card on your dash. Set it as the home screen on your phone. Put it in your notes on your phone. Write it in your journal right now. And my challenge to you over the next seven days is to take time every day to read that truth. But more than that, what I want you to do is I want you to proclaim that truth until God starts to renew your mind. I would say it like this. Write it. Read it. Proclaim it until you believe it. You want to write it down. You want to read it. You want to say it out loud. That's not weird, I promise. Say it out loud until you start to believe God's truth about you. And this will take time. The truth is you should do this multiple times a day, every day. And when you start to go down that path, when your mind starts to drift away from where you want it to be, you write it, read it, proclaim it until you believe it. And what you are doing is you are creating a new neural pathway. Let me give you some examples of what yours might look like. You might be struggling to know God's will for your life, and so you're going to create a statement. It could go something like this. My life belongs to God. Daily I seek him, and daily he directs my steps. I know his voice, and he leads me. You're going to write it down. You're going to read it. You're going to say it until you believe this is true about you over and over again. My life belongs to God. Daily I seek him and daily he directs my steps. I know his voice and he leads me. Now you may be lacking in confidence. Maybe you feel insecure or inadequate. You feel like you're not good enough and your statement could look like this. My confidence is in Jesus and Jesus alone. I can do everything he calls me to do. He gives me strength. He is with me. You might struggle with sinful thoughts and you're sick and tired of being hostage to those images and those shameful ideas. And so you want God to renew your mind. So you're gonna say over and over again, I'm not a slave to my thoughts because God has set me free. I will honor him with my eyes and my mind. My God is faithful. And even if I am tempted, he will always give me a way out. You might find comfort in things like food or alcohol or money, really the things of this world. And you don't want to do that anymore. So you're gonna declare, when I'm stressed, I turn to God. I come to Jesus because he is all I need. In him, I find strength and comfort. You might find yourself battling with worry all the time from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed. Even when you're falling asleep, even when you're sleeping, your your mind is racing with worry. But this week, you will write it and read it. and You'll say it out loud until you believe it. Because of Jesus, I'm not anxious about anything. I cast my cares on God because he cares for me. I have the peace of God dwelling in my heart and ruling my mind. What is the stronghold where the wires are crossed and what is the scriptural truth that will set you free? Write it, read it, proclaim it until you believe it. Create new neural pathways built on God's truth and renew your mind. Let me share you how this plays out in my life uh, because I know that some of you are skeptical and that's fine. Uh, I know that some of you are hesitant to do this. Uh, I would push and say you shouldn't be. Um, but I get it. And so as I've shared, uh, I battle with thoughts of inadequacy, meaning no matter what I do, I never feel like I'm enough. Uh, and this just haunts me every moment of every single day. And, and being a pastor, um, I think it makes it even worse because I know that I can't get it all done. There, there is a truth that I will always, always let somebody down. I, I can't be everything for everyone. And when I try to give my very best to collective, I fall short as a husband and a father. And the moment I try to refocus on being a better husband and a dad, what ends up happening is I fall short as the leader of collective. And this is a stronghold that holds me back and fills me with this ongoing guilt uh, and even shame. Uh, And I struggle with this all the time. I lose sleep over this. I have dreams about this. I had a dream last night. Every Saturday night, I have a terrible dream about failing you guys as your pastor. And I hate to admit this, but sometimes I feel like I care more about how you are going to respond to what we do at Collective than even what God thinks, right? And there'll be times when I'm really bold and I'm preaching some hard things, right? And I'm pushing you guys because I know God is pushing me to do so. But when I get home, I have this overwhelming sense of insecurity and my thoughts start to run wild. Really, it takes the moment I get into my vehicle and these thoughts say that they're never coming back, that I pushed too hard that I screwed this up, maybe I'm not actually cut out for this. There are times in my life when my priorities are out of whack and I work way, way, way too hard and I neglect the things and the people that matter the most to me. 
There are times when I just feel incredibly discouraged just thinking, I don't know if I can write another sermon this week. People have actually said to me in the past, haven't you talked about this topic before? Yes. Uh, it's been six years. I've written 300 sermons. Uh, this is like doing a book report, but it's the same book every single week. <laughs> as we head into Christmas, Jesus is still born of a virgin. <laughs> and as we head into Easter, the tomb is still empty. And so I struggle with how I can creatively express something in an interesting and engaging and really a challenging way that helps transform people's lives. And so I battle with these deep feelings of inadequacy. And so what I've done with the help of my counselor through Crucible, through um, the encouragement of my mentor, is I have some truths that I remind myself of regularly. Um, These are the things I go back to when I'm struggling the most, and they go like this. This is the truth, and this is what God is using to renew my mind. Jesus comes first. I wouldn't be who I am or where I am without Jesus, and I am immensely thankful for that. I love my wife and I will lay down my life for her. I love my girls, and my responsibility as their father is to show them what it looks like to love God and love people. I love the church, and God has asked me to lead so that other people can experience grace and endless second chances. And because he has called me to this, I'm going to trust that he is going ahead of me. I am ridiculously in charge of my own life and my own decisions, and I can't blame anyone else for the ways that I fall short. God created me to be bold and intentional and thoughtful, and how he created me is what serves this church the best. I daily bring my best and then some, and it's what I do after I bring my best that truly makes the difference. And I believe this to be true, that the world will be different and better because I serve Jesus today. And these are things I've been repeating to myself for years. And I will tell you, I still battle. These are written down. These are in places I can see them. I have stuff in my office that reminds me when I hit those moments that God has called me to do this and he is ahead of me, that he has given me what I need to be successful as a husband and as a pastor and as a father. And when I feel like I can't keep going, it's not about me, it's about him. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And if you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. So fix your mind on what is true and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Fix your mind on the truth. Write it, read it, proclaim it until you believe it. Because we will not be conformed to the patterns of this world. We will be transformed. Not by trying harder, not by being smarter, not by our own personal effort, but by the renewing of our minds. And what is the greatest power to overcome these lies? It's Jesus. It's his truth and what he says about us. Let's pray. God, for so many of us, um, the war that we have been waging is decades long. God, it is, it is not new. To be honest, it is not fresh. But that wound still feels just so present in our lives. And God, we can go back to our childhood. We can go back to our teenage years. Some of us can go back to a marriage in our 20s where we felt like we weren't enough. God, it's because we failed or we fell short or it's because other people believed we failed and fell short and we've been holding on to that lie for a very long time and it has changed who we are. Because of that, God, we are not who we want to be and we are not who you want us to be. And God, what's scary is that we know that one lie repeated over and over and over again um, needs something five times stronger to defeat it and that is intimidating. But God, we are so thankful that we have your word, God, that we have scripture, that we have the Bible that we can look at, we can read every single day. 50,000 times doesn't seem that intimidating when we can read it over and over and over and over again. So God, I, I just pray this week, as we continue to battle these thoughts, as we continue to wrestle with these lies, as we try to defeat these strongholds, God, that we take the time not just to think about it, but God, that we write it down that we look at it every single day, that we say it out loud, that we remind ourselves, not our truth, your truth about us. God, ultimately, we are just so thankful that even though we don't feel like we are enough, uh, you love us. God, even though we feel unlovable, um, you want what's best for us, and you love us, and you offer us grace and these wonderful things that we don't deserve. God, help us be reminded of those things every single day. Help us defeat these wars and these lies that are in our mind. God, we love you and pray this in your name. Amen.